Once upon a time, at Christmas, a long time ago, poor people could still be seen walking around on the streets. At that time, it wasn't shameful to be poor. So ragamuffins and lost souls didn't have to stay out of sight, but could walk around wherever they wanted. When the Christmas that this story is about was approaching, there was the usual activity. Lots of baking, and sausage making, dusting and polishing, rummaging and wrapping, and a vast increase in business that made the rich businessmen even richer and the poor customers even poorer. In one of the main post offices in the capital city stood Christopher Johnson sorting incoming packages. Christopher Johnson was 14 years old and went to school, but for the moment there he stood sorting packages. During the days just before Christmas, the post office hired school children to work all night, since the regular personnel went home at five o'clock. Now perhaps you feel sorry for Christopher Johnson because he had to stand all night sorting incoming packages, but really, there is no reason to feel sorry for him at all. He came from a well-to-do family. His father owned a department store and got richer every day selling table mats and china ornaments. It was just that Christopher thought it was fun to earn a little money himself. While Christopher stood throwing packages labelled glass, handle with care, onto the stone floor of the fragile room, he thought of Robin Hood. Robin Hood was Christopher's idol. Heroism, comradeship, Fat monks who fought with staffs in the fear of God for a just cause. Healthy outdoor life. Helping virtuous virgins across streams and rivers. And reverence for the legal king. Those were some of the things which seemed to Christopher Johnson to be the best life had to offer. And of course, the principle of lawless justice. Take from the rich and give to the poor. At four o'clock in the morning, with a sigh of relief, Christopher broke the last crystal vase wrapped up in cardboard against the concrete wall of the Royal Post Office and went home through the empty streets. His steps echoed against the walls of the houses to take from the rich and give to the poor. Christmas was near. These unfortunate people for whom the Salvation Army's pots are kept boiling. Goodwill to all men. The Christmas candles are lit again. Who lights a candle for those who wander in the dark? Dancing around the Christmas tree, a time of joy. Cold shines the star of Christmas on those who have no home. To take from the rich and give to the poor. To take from the rich and give to the poor. It was then that Christopher Johnson made his decision. At half past twelve the next day, Christopher was wakened by his loving mother. He got up, ate his two fried eggs and sausage, sneaked into his father's library, swiped his directory of tax assessments and left for the post office. He began to sort incoming packages with the repetitious monotony that such a job imposed upon anyone who did it. But his eye checked on the addressee of every package. It was particularly the title before the name that interested him. T 
Titles like lathe turner, construction worker, nurse's aide, salesman, seamstress, titles like these he put on their respective piles of packages. But when he found a name with a title like director, he allowed the director's package to slip down into a special sack that he had beside him. That was also the place where packages ended up that were addressed to the likes of civil engineers, colonel's wives, bankers, mine owners, and real estate brokers. To take from the rich and give to the poor. By supper time, the sack by his side was well filled with packages. He stayed behind when the others went to have something to eat, and as soon as he was alone, he took out the directory of tax assessments and started checking the packages in his special sack. Company director H.K. Bergdahl, assessed for 65,000 per year. Bergdahl went back into the special sack. So did all the other packages whose addressees earn more than 50,000 per year. Even a package for his own father from Aunt Martha ended up in the special sack. No favoritism. Equality for everyone. Now the sack was full to the top. He tied up the sack, fastened one of the post office address labels to the string, wrote his own name and address on the card, and put the sack out with the big pile of sacks which were to be delivered the next day. The next day was Christmas Eve. Christopher was wakened at 12 o'clock by his loving mother who stood beside the bed with tinsel in her hair and a tray with coffee and ginger biscuits in her hand and said, Christopher, there's a big sack full of parcels for you. Uh, oh, uh, they're the ones I've got to sort out. There's a lot to do. Poor Christopher, surely they don't expect you to work on Christmas Eve. <gasps> One has to do one's duty in life, you see, Mother, said Christopher. A job well done gives inner satisfaction and is the foundation upon which society is built. Christopher's loving mother looked at her boy, moved and proud. My dear little boy. Christopher went down to the hall where the sack stood, dragged it into his father's library and emptied it on the floor. He sat down at his father's desk, and took a book of gummed labels of the type his mother used on our homemade jam jars. On each label he wrote in red ink. Merry Christmas from an unknown benefactor. He stuck the labels on top of the addressee's name on all the packages and covered the sender's name and address with a Christmas star made out of gilt paper. The living room was already filled with the Christmas spirit. Christmas songs came from the radio. Other Christmas songs came from the television set. Everyone was good and kind to the depths of their being. In short, Christmas had come. Hmm. Ooh. <clears throat> the very merriest of Christmases to you, my good boy. <laughs> Would you like to sniff the spiced wine, son? I've finished the tree now, Charles. Come here and put the star on top. Look, isn't it beautiful? This was Father's big job at Christmas. Putting on top of the Christmas tree the big, expensive star which anyone could buy at his department store, but which, of course, he took for free. With sounds of celebration, the family ate its Christmas Eve meal. After dinner, Christopher said, Would you excuse me? I must start my deliveries. I'll tell you what, we can take the car. I'll drive you around. Absolutely out of the question, Charles. You've had too much to drink. Christopher drew a sigh of relief. Well, take this for a taxi then, said Father, who'd softened up with the drink. Thank you, Father, said Christopher. He ordered a taxi, went down to the cellar where his father kept his Santa Claus outfit, took it with him, dragged the sack out to the taxi and said to the driver, Take me to the slum district. The driver looked suspiciously in the mirror as if he were driving a thief. 
But Christopher's honest face reassured him, and he drove him to the dirty slum district that existed in the city at the time this story took place. When Christopher had paid the taxi, he went into a doorway and put on his father's somewhat too large Santa Claus outfit. Then he went out on his humanitarian Christmas mission. Have you got any young children at home? What? Take this parcel and go straight home to your poor family. Merry Christmas. Ha, said to you. <laughs> ha. Christopher happily continued to light up the shady side of humanity with his little sparks of friendliness. He knocked on the rottenest doors, approached the most ragged tramps, talked to the loneliest old people, and placed packages among the bottles in front of the saddest day workers at the beer hall. Let's see what's there. Here you are. Oh, God. Oh, it's empty. Now then. Just, ah, there. Thank you, dear. Mm, nice. What's in there? Oh, so it, it's a sack. Soon it will be Christmas. Christmas time is here. For Christopher, the rest of Christmas Eve passed in an atmosphere of inner joy, a feeling which good deeds give to those who do them. And when everyone had got his presents, Christmas Eve ebbed away with that mutual feeling of devoutness which only an old movie on television can give people. In the middle of the movie, the telephone rang. Oh, hello? Auntie Martha! Merry Christmas! What? A hand-painted china plate? No. No, we haven't received a hand-painted china plate. With a what? Oh, a flower motif! Carnations in a pot? No, I'm sorry, Auntie Martha, but we didn't receive... Yes, yes, do that, Auntie Martha. Goodbye. Take care of yourself. Oh. Charles, can you hear me, Charles? Auntie Martha sent us a lovely hand-painted china plate. Oh, well, thank heavens it didn't arrive. Yeah, now be quiet. I'm watching television. But Charles, she hung up on me. She said she was going to phone the Director General of the Post Office Department. Poor man. I expect he's trying to watch TV. Now be quiet. Dear me, how strange that it should have got lost. Can you understand it? Christopher, you work at the post office. During a fraction of a second, Christopher went through an emotional crisis. Lie to his mother on Christmas Eve? No. Resolutely tell the truth? Yes. I put the parcel aside and gave it to someone poor, said Christopher. What? What? 
What did I hear you say you did? I gave Auntie Martha's plate to someone poor. Have you gone mad, boy? What? I've taken lots of other parcels from rich people and given them to poor people. What? I've harbored a communist in my breast. Charles Johnson was one of those who thought that anyone who voluntarily gave anything away was a communist. But, Father, you said yourself that you didn't want Auntie's plate. Said? Said? It was my plate. What do you think all the others will say? I mean, who else have you stolen from besides me? They're ticked off in your book of tax assessments. I don't believe this. Don't you see what you've done? You could be sent to an institution for this. I'm prepared to take the consequences, Father. All I've done is give a little Christmas joy to those poor people who don't own a department store. Charles Johnson was almost strangled by his Christmas anger. Oh, first thing tomorrow, my boy, you're coming round with me to beg forgiveness from all the people you've stolen from. Now off to bed. You can't stay up and watch the end of the film. Oh, dear me. Christopher went to bed. He'd already read in the newspapers how the film ended. He went to sleep and dreamed that he was sleeping under the open sky in Sherwood Forest. Let us now stop a moment and ask a few questions. Wouldn't Christopher's father's heart have softened if he had seen with his own eyes the joy that his son had spread at the bottom rung of society's ladder? Could he have remained angry if he'd caught a glimpse of the home of Harold Bertram, where the children were playing happily with the six Japanese napkin rings of pear tree wood? And how could he have remained indignant if he had been present when the lonely widow, Elizabeth Hartfield, opened her package and with tears in her eyes found a bottle of aftershave lotion? Such questions will never be answered. Charles Johnson fell asleep this Christmas night in anger. Not even the joyful message of the early morning television church service about peace on earth and goodwill to all men could make Charles Johnson's disposition any more charitable. He was a man of justice who didn't want to be mixed up with any thievery. Later that day, he took his directory of tax assessments and his son and went on a pilgrimage to a number of people with incomes of more than 50,000 a year. <laughs> <laughs> Company director Bergdahl had a mahogany door and a maid. May we speak to Mr. Bergdahl? It's about a Christmas present. They were shown into a large room where Mr. Bergdahl was trying out the pool table he'd given his mother for a Christmas present. <clears throat> yes, good afternoon, sir. I, well, the thing is, I'm afraid my son has given one of your Christmas presents to someone poor. I wanted to say I'm sorry, but it's just that you're already so rich and happy without that present, so that I wanted to see that it spread a little sunshine on the lower rungs of society's ladder. Mr. Bergdahl stood with his mouth open. Well, my goodness, if that isn't the nicest thing I've heard since my confirmation. Have some cake. Oh, thank you. Oh, it must be Uncle Arthur's matchstick picture of the Taj Mahal by moonlight. He called yesterday to ask about it. I do so hope it was beautiful, because that's what I told him. Yes, that's what we usually say when they ask. Well, my goodness, one can't keep track of all the rubbish all those loonies in the family keep sending us. Thank you, young man, for relieving us from the Taj Mahal by moonlight. 
<laughs> Christopher's journey of apology more and more turned into a regular journey of triumph. Everywhere he went, he was treated like a hero. And the joy of the families who'd been stolen from when they heard that the hand-knitted wool sweaters and specially designed paperweights had ended up with someone who needed them more knew no bounds. Charles Johnson's embarrassment over his son's behaviour was gradually replaced by a proud smile. Well, of course, I may not be the right person to suggest this, but all the same, it seems to me that the general consensus of opinion would make it appropriate for me to suggest three cheers for my son, Christopher. Hip, hip! Hooray! Hip, hip! Hooray! Hooray! Hip, hip! Hooray! <laughs> oh, come along, my boy. Come along with me. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. When they got home, night had already fallen and the Christmas star lit their way. Uh, come in here, my dear. Uh, our son is a kind and humble human being, was Charles <laughs> Johnson's joyful message to the family when they came home. Oh, what? blessings this Christmas has brought. Note the religious look in her eyes. This story took place in the days when Christmas was celebrated as a memorial to the birth of Christ. Merry Christmas. <laughs>